Hello and welcome to the circuit service for the North Yorkshire coast. Today we're at Filey and I hope that you all are blessed as you enjoy this service in your own home. Let us pray. God our Father, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. We believe it, Lord, but scarcely begin to understand. Your glory is too great for words, yet we can see it. We see it in the wonder of creation. We see it in the life that you have given to each one of us. We see it in the events of history. And most clearly, we see your glory in the person of Jesus Christ. So we come today to join with all your people, past, present and to come, and say, Holy, Holy, Holy Mighty God, all space and all time and beyond show forth your glory, now and always, and we adore you. Father, we thank you. We thank you for life, for our birth into the world, made in your image to be stewards of your creation, for our bodies and for strength, health, physical well-being and enjoyment, for our minds and our spirits and our feelings and experiences of joy. We thank you for life in all its fullness, 
life which was made visible in Jesus Christ, that life together that we can enjoy because of him, life eternal in which nothing can separate us from your love. We thank you for lives that have been lived to the full, for the lives that have been poured out in love, for lives which have been inspired, which have inspired us to new discovery, for lives which have helped us to be what we are. Father, Lord of all, we thank you. But Lord, we ask for your forgiveness for the times that we have been far less than you call us to be. Lord, take us, renew us and remake us and help us to live to glorify you in our everyday living. Amen. Listen while I sing you this song, a song of my friend and his vineyard. My friend had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug the soil, cleared it of stones, he planted the finest vines, he built a, power, a tower to guard them, dug a pit for treading the grapes. He waited for the grapes to ripen, but every grape was sour. So now my friend says, you people who live in Jerusalem and Judah, judge between my vineyard and me. Is there anything I failed to do for it? Then why did it produce sour grapes and not the good grapes I expected? This is what I am going to do to my vineyard. I will take away the hedge round it, break down the wall that protects it, and let wild animals eat it and trample it down. I will let it be overgrown with weeds. I will not prune the vines or hoe the ground. Instead, I will let briars and thorns cover it. I will even forbid the clouds to let rain fall on it. Israel is the vineyard of the Lord Almighty. The people of Judah are the vines he planted. He expected them to do what was good, but instead they committed murder. He expected them to do what was right, but their victims cried out for justice. The kingdom of heaven is like this. Once there was a man who went out early in the morning to hire some men to work in his vineyard. He agreed to pay them the regular wage, a silver coin a day, and sent them to work in his vineyard. 
He went out again to the marketplace at nine o'clock and saw some men standing there doing, doing nothing. So he told them, You also go and work in the vineyard, and I will pay you a fair wage. So they went. Then at twelve o'clock, and again at three o'clock, he did the same thing. It was nearly five o'clock when he went to the marketplace and saw some other men still standing there. Why are you wasting the whole day here doing nothing? He said to them. No one hired us, they answered. Well then, you also go and work in the vineyard, he told them. When evening came, the owner told his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, starting with those who were hired last and ending with those who were hired first. The men who had begun to work at five o'clock were paid a silver coin each. So when the men were the first to be hired came to be paid, they thought they would get more. But they too were given a silver coin each. They took their money and started grumbling against the employer. These men who were hired last worked only one hour, while we put up with a whole day's work in the hot sun, yet you paid them the same as you paid us. Listen, friend, the, ans the owner answered one of them. I have not cheated you. After all, you agreed to do a day's work for one silver coin. Now take your pay and go home. I want to give this man who was hired last as much as much as I have given you. Don't I have the right to do as I wish with my own money? Or are you jealous because I am generous? And Jesus concluded, so those who are last will be first, and those who are first will be last.
Jesus told a parable which would bring tears to the eyes of most trade unionists. People worked in the vineyard, some for 12 hours, some for 9, 6, 3 hours, some for even 1 hour, and all received the same amount of pay. Imagine if Tesco paid the same money to the full-time and part-time workers and those who just had a Saturday job. There'd be quite an uproar and the full-time workers would be shouting the loudest. The owner of the vineyard in the parable protests that he hasn't wronged anybody. Even the 12-hour workers were paid as much as had been agreed in advance. But it still strikes us as unfair that people who'd worked through the heat of the day for 12 hours were only paid the same as those who worked for one hour in the cool of the evening. Presumably, this was just a story that Jesus made up. But could such a thing have possibly happened? It could have been that if the owner of the vineyard towards the end of the day realised he wasn't going to have as many great sticks as he hoped for and managed to recruit some people at the last minute, he would still want to pay them a decent wage. The denarius, the silver coin that each man received, was a typical day's pay deemed to be sufficient to buy food for an average sized family for one day. There'd be no point giving the people who'd worked one hour a twelfth of a denarius, even if there was such a coin. That wouldn't go anywhere at all. On the other hand, he couldn't afford to pay the people who'd worked all day 12 days' wages, and so this was his compromise. Everybody gets one day's wage, regardless of how many hours they worked. But whatever the situation, first and foremost, this is a parable, and so we look for a spiritual meaning. Perhaps it's a warning against jealousy. The owner says in the parable to the 12 hour workers, are you jealous because I'm generous? Those people who worked 12 hours would have been quite satisfied with their one silver coin if the people who'd worked such a shorter time had been paid proportionately less. It was only when they found out that those other people were getting a better deal that they started to complain. It is easy to be jealous if some people seem to be better off than we are. For between 2016 and 2020, I was in retirement. At that time, my wife, Glynis, and I were living in a three-bedroom detached house that belongs to the Methodist Minister's Housing Society. And one day, we looked around a beautiful show house that was so much bigger and nicer than the house we lived in. And we felt discontent. Somebody's going to be able to afford that beautiful four-bedroomed house. Why can't it be us? But one of the Ten Commandments says, Thou shalt not covet. And Paul says in his first letter to Timothy, If you have food and clothing, be content with that. So the parable could be a warning against jealousy and covetousness. Or it might be offering the possibility of a deathbed repentance. Just as the outcome was the same for all those workers, whether they worked for 12 hours or one hour, so the possibility of heaven is open not just to people who have been committed Christians since childhood and throughout their lives, but for those who make a Christian commitment very late on in life. One of the men who was crucified next to Jesus hadn't followed the way of God through his lifetime, but he was saved on the very last day of his life. I went to a humanist funeral once. I was there because the person who had died was the mother of the Sunday school superintendent of one of my churches. And at the end of the funeral, the son-in-law was in tears and he said to me, she didn't know Jesus as her saviour. He was anxious about her eternal destiny. But it could be that she had made a commitment 
in the very last few hours of their life and he wasn't aware of it. Some Christians believe that when a person is dying, if they haven't shown any interest in Christianity in their lifetime, that God appears to them in the last moments of their life and gives them that opportunity to put their faith and trust in him. I don't know if they're right or not. I can't see anything in the Bible to say one way or the other. But I do know what the Bible does say. Peter, in his second letter, says it's not God's will that any should perish. He wants all to come to repentance. And Paul says in his first letter to Timothy, God wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. So even if we have loved ones who don't appear to show any interest in the Christian faith at all, we shouldn't give up on them. It's never too late as far as God is concerned. Or to come at this parable from a different angle, somebody once said that myths support the status quo and parables challenge it. So for example, if you're living in a country which is really male dominated and you want to keep things that way, you might tell a story of a man who is a breadwinner, whose wife is a full-time homemaker and mother. If you want to challenge the status quo, you tell a story of a very successful woman who's a hospital consultant, earning enough money so that her husband can stay at home and look after the children and do the housework. Was Jesus, by telling parables, wanting to challenge his hearers and make them rethink their preconceptions? There's another parable which he told in Mark's Gospel, and at the end of it, Mark says, the religious leaders knew that this parable was aimed at them. We normally think of parables as being pleasant stories with a moral, something like an Aesop fable, suitable for all the family to enjoy. But just to illustrate that parables aren't always nice stories, think about the very famous and well-loved parable of the Good Samaritan. Samaritans had some Jewish blood in them, but they were very much the product of mixed marriages and they were hated by the Jews of purer pedigree. So why tell a story to a Jewish audience where the Samaritan is the hero and the villains are respected religious Jewish leaders? It would, like, it would be like going into a, a Protestant church in Belfast before the IRA declared a ceasefire and telling the story of the good Sinn Féin member. Somebody was even braver than I am and said it would be like going into a church in the United States the Sunday after the 9-11 atrocities and telling the story of the good Muslim. Why, if Jesus just wanted to answer the question, who is my neighbour, why not tell a story of the good Jew who went out of his way to help a Samaritan? He was obviously trying to ruffle feathers and to make people rethink their ideas. Going back to the parable we're supposed to be talking about, the workers in the vineyard, was Jesus trying to shock his hearers then? The unfairness of the details of the parable would shock them just as they've probably shocked us. It would also ring a bell for them with the mention of the word vineyard. As we heard in the Old Testament reading, the vineyard was applied by the prophets to the Jews, usually telling them off for not being fruitful, for not living like the people of God. And so they would immediately be looking to see how this parable of the vineyard affected them. I suspect that those Jews who could trace their ancestry as far back as Abraham would see themselves as the 12 hour workers, those who could trace their family tree back to Moses, the nine hour workers, 
Perhaps those who could go back as far as the return from Babylon 500 years previously would be the six hour workers. Perhaps those working a shorter time would be converts from gen the Gentiles, from pagan religions. Were they all of equal status in God's sight? You only have to look at those genealogies, so and so begat so and so, to see how important it was to have a long pedigree. And it would be quite shocking what Jesus was saying in this parable to his Jewish hearers. Perhaps it will become even more meaningful and understandable some years later when the Christian church was in existence. To begin with, it was made up of Jews who believed that Jesus was their promised Messiah. But as we read this story in Acts chapter 8, Samaritans, half Jews, become Christians. Some of them are received into the Christian church. And by Acts chapter 10 and 11, Gentiles, people with no Jewish blood in them at all, were being converted and belonging to the church. Were they all of equal status? The Jews who'd always been the people of God, who are now believers in Jesus Christ? Yes, you are all equals, says Paul. In Christ there is neither Jew nor Gentile. All are one in Christ. Quite a shocking thing for those Jewish people to hear. As we've gone along, we've tried to apply this parable to ourselves. The warning about not being jealous, being reassured of the possibility of a last, last minute repentance. But does this last interpretation, all being one in Christ, does that mean that there's no pecking order in the Christian church, are those who have only just started attending church on a par with those who have been coming, worshipping and serving in the church for many, many years. Length of service is important to many Christians. When I was going to church as a teenager, I usually sat next to the communion steward and every time we had communion, he would tell me all the years that he'd been doing that job. Length of service is important. But there was a book a few years ago written by an American Methodist bishop, probably we don't like the two words going together, Methodist and bishop, but they have them in America. He wrote a book called <coughs> the, the Five Marks of a Fruitful Church. And one of these characteristics was radical hospitality, where a church would go out of their way to welcome new people, something which I'm fully in agreement with, but I question the word hospitality. I remember going to somebody's house as a guest. I arrived at the time they said. I sat, sat where I was told to sit. I ate what was sat before me, even though I might have preferred something else. If I needed the bathroom, I had to ask permission, and I had to be careful what time I left. It would have been rude if I'd left as soon as I'd finished the meal, but on the other hand, I didn't want to outstay my welcome. My hosts were very hospitable, but I had to remember that I was just a guest in their house. If I started acting as though I was a member of the family, I would have been abusing my hospita their hospitality. So is hospitality the right word? Are we saying to new people, it's our church really, you're welcome, but you remember, you're here by our invitation or permission. Not at all. It's their church as much as it is ours. Unfair? As unfair as the parable? It might seem so, but Jesus tells us in the Sermon of the Mount that our reward is in the future, in the next life. He says, the less credit we receive for the good we do in this lifetime, the greater our reward will be in the world to come. Paul says in his last letter that he wrote to the second Timothy, that there's laid up for him a crown of righteousness, 
which will be given to him on that final day. And not just for him only, but for all who have faithfully served the Lord. This life, this Christian life, isn't about seniority or status, but about servanthood. It's a diffi difficult parable. I've suggested two or three different interpretations, and I hope at least one is of some help. Amen. of intercession let us pray loving Lord we come to pray for a world hurting or in pain in so many ways a world so often lost without you we pray for all who are caught up in the middle of war all who are hungry thirsty and cold living in the grip of poverty we pray that your will to love, heal and live in peace may be done and your kingdom come. Lord, we pray for families devastated by the recent natural disasters in Libya and Morocco. Grief stricken by all they have lost and by the horror they have seen around them horror that we can least imagine. Loving Lord, give energy, strength and perseverance to all who are helping in any way to relieve and rescue these suffering peoples. May your will to love and heal be done and your kingdom come. Loving Lord, we pray for Christians throughout the world persecuted for their faith. Their faith that simply loving Jesus 
is what they want to do and sharing the good news of the gospel. We give thanks for the work of the Bible Society, translating the Bible so that so many people are able to read it in their native languages. We pray protection on all these, the persecuted ones, all who are brothers and sisters in Christ. May your will be done and your kingdom come. Loving God, we pray for the church throughout the world, thinking now of the Methodist Church in Britain. We pray for the Reverend Gillian Newton, our president, and Deacon Kerry Scarlett, our vice president. We pray for good health and stamina to sustain them through the experiences and challenges of the year ahead. We pray for the church to take seriously the call to be reshaped and renewed. May your will be done and your kingdom come. We pray for ourselves that we may use our gifts and talents abundantly to extend God's kingdom here and now where we are. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Help us to let go of all that holds us back and help us to go forward in the name of Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen.
Lord, call. 